Are you an independent musician feeling overwhelmed by the endless act of juggling creativity, business and self-care? You're not alone. That's why I created the Artist Mind Map. The Artist Mind Map is a free blueprint designed to help you get clear on the route you need to take to attain your career goals in alignment to your artistic values. This is not just another random PDF page for the forgotten corners of your hard disk. It's a timeless roadmap you can use for decades to come. Think of it as a go-to overview to consult. When you grab your free mind map, you get exclusive access to a masterclass that will take your career to the next level. I use the same methodologies and systems for my high-end paying clients and students. So why am I giving it to you for free? Simple. I want to build a community of artists who can count on each other for safe spaces. Music saved my life. I believe that you have all that it takes to be the artist you were meant to be if you're willing to put in the work. And more importantly, understanding what that work is. And the Artist Mind Map was designed to help you do exactly that. So if this resonates with you, go to artistmindmap.com and download this resource. artistmindmap.com Welcome to another session solo cast. These solo casts were designed to help independent artists and musicians like you navigate the very complex labyrinth that is your artistic practice and career. They're based on empirical research and experiences of my own career as an independent musician and an educator and coach working with artists just like you. The primary aim behind these sessions is to offer accessibility to the kind of education many of us need to work with in order to forward ourselves in these very confusing times as empowered and independent artists in the truest sense of the word. How to set healthy boundaries as an artist. Before I start today's episode, I should let you know, I've been meaning to address the topic of boundaries for a while now. It's a biggie. It's a biggie. And to be absolutely honest, I wasn't even sure if I wanted to get mixed up in all the noise involving this word at the moment online, except in my coaching sessions and my artist development course, which is out there now online, we talk about boundaries quite a bit. So it felt slightly... Well, hypocritical is probably a bit dramatic, but it did feel a little out of balance to just include it in a course and not actually expand upon the implications that come with this word. So I got into the shed, did some research. I tried to research for most of the content, I, actually all of the content I put out, especially, um, I, I don't know how many of you know about this, but uh, we are more than 40 posts i think we're at 45 blog posts Uh, and i keep going back and editing these on the holistic musician academy website uh, constantly and all of this is researched and uh, the research continues with this specific theme we want to talk about today boundaries i put in a little more research than i usually do Um, Not because the rest of the articles get lesser research from me, but because I did want to make sure that now that I'm finally putting myself out there and taking the bull by these horns, I'm going to try my best to give you the best results. Long story cut short, this episode's about boundaries. It's called how to set boundaries as, excuse me, how to set healthy boundaries as an artist. And I'm going to do my best to give you something that's actually going to help you understand what the F this whole thing about boundaries is. You ready for this? Let's go. Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries in recent years, especially the post-pandemic ones. This word has become a very dominant theme across social media discussions around mental health and well-being. Now that's a good thing, except what was once the basis of an intricate therapeutic tool in psychology has now morphed into another buzzword. And uh, it's been simplified into bite-sized Instagram-centric viral posts, hashtags, slogans, rants, and the works. So if you're a bit confused about it all at this point, you're not alone. I don't know about you, but for, for the longest time, I was 
confused. I was confused with regards to the responses and the way the word was being used. And I actually have a background in psychology and I still found it quite a lot to handle. So to start off with, let's get this clear from the very start. Okay. Um, Boundaries are essential for maintaining healthy relationships and emotional well-being. I advocate them heartily. So in case you've ever, you know, just to clarify, boundaries are a legit thing. That is not the issue here in the first place. That being said, the term continuously gets taken out of context a lot and misrepresented both in everyday life and the digital space. And that is the kind of risky pattern that could potentially hinder not just communication skills, but also damage important relationships and compromise personal and professional integrity. Those are strong words, I know. So let's discuss the concept of boundaries, their origins and intent. Let's unpack this for a bit. The concept of boundaries in psychology stems from the work of several scholars, particularly in the family systems theory which emphasizes the importance of defining clear interpersonal boundaries for healthy functioning. FYI, a lot of these podcasts, these solo casts are based on blog posts, which are on Holistic Musician Academy. And um, for those of you who want to dig deeper, the written version of these podcasts, including the one today, has a bunch of references, which I also keep updating So when I talk about boundaries and um, the origins and intent are the same, most of the material I'm referring to, most of the definitions, the ideas I'm sharing here, they're not just bland or blatant opinions. They're actually based on research, references to which you can look up on my blog. The concept of boundaries in psychology stems from the work of several scholars, right? Notably, American psychiatrist and professor Murray Bowen, excuse me, Murray Bowen, um, 1913 to 1990, was one of the key figures in developing this framework, introducing the concept of differentiation of self in family dynamics. Boundaries are meant to create a balance between closeness and distance, allowing individuals to maintain a sense of self while still engaging with others. Unfortunately, Poor general awareness has enabled social media to reduce the concept to somewhat superficial and um, also somewhat rigid pop, quote unquote, pop rule book and kind of ends up encouraging us to draw hard lines sometimes to avoid any form of discomfort. When we're drawing these hard lines, we're often missing out on the chance of actually growing the necessary skills to understand the source of what is a much bigger problem. Let me repeat that. Boundaries are often taken out of context as a result of which it ends up encouraging us to draw lines to avoid any form of discomfort. That's how most of us interpret boundaries. However, this very lopsided approach robs us of the chance of growing a much more necessary skill, which is understanding the source of a much bigger problem, which is where is the discomfort coming from? Where is the discomfort that makes us want to draw these boundaries? Where is the discomfort really coming from? And to understand that and unpack that and address that is uh, arguably not just an equally but probably even more necessary skill. Setting limits is crucial, but this oversimplification bypasses an equally important reality in the equation, that boundaries are dynamic, relational, and constantly shifting depending on the context and people involved. Also, in practice... They're not about baseless avoidance on a whim, but about fostering open, mature communication and mutual respect and emotional safety. Let me say that again. In practice, they're not about baseless avoidance on a whim, but about fostering open, mature communication 
mutual respect and emotional safety. Those are the goals you want to reach by using boundaries as a tool. Which is why the misuse of boundaries is something that needs to be talked about. And and the biggest um, manner in which that's usually prevalent is avoiding accountability. That's one of the most problematic trends in the popularization of boundaries as a tool to evade accountability. It is a problem. In personal and professional relationships, we increasingly use phrases like that's my boundary as a defense against engaging in any difficult or uncomfortable conversations. This reflects a serious misunderstanding of the original purpose of boundaries, which is to manage emotional resources while maintaining connections, not justify emotional avoidance or detachment. In the context of Independent artists and musicians and their lifestyles where collaboration is essential, the misuse of boundaries can have a particularly negative impact. Yeah, because creative endeavors often require a delicate balance of shared input and individual expression. But if one party keeps using boundaries as a way to shut down feedback or limit collaboration, the result can be a breakdown in trust and stunted creativity. Now, bear with, that's just one side of the story. Because on the other hand, healthy boundaries are also crucial for protecting creative autonomy and emotional well-being in collaborative environments as well. So, while excessive rigidity can hinder teamwork, a lack of clear boundaries, on the other hand, can also lead to unnecessary emotional strain or exploitation. Let's talk about a few cultural contexts here now. This podcast is, um, you know, does its best to give you folks a global perspective. Here's the thing. One of the complexities of this whole discourse is how its application varies significantly across cultures. In Western psychology, boundaries are often framed through an individualistic lens focusing on personal autonomy, independence, and self-care. This aligns well with the inherently individualistic cultural values that prioritize the individual over the collective. But in many non-Western cultural contexts, like those in South Asia or Asia, uh, I've mentioned South Asia specifically because that's where I have a deep connection, Um, parts of Latin America, Africa. The the concept of boundaries was a somewhat foreign one until recently, and it may be perceived very differently due to the general focus being based on a more collective lens, communal mindsets, familial duty, and the general you know, vibe of um, interconnectedness. In social circles like these, boundaries may not be clearly articulated and Asserting personal space can even be viewed as selfish or disrespectful. So the limits of Western psychology lies there in that while it's foundational, Western psychology is foundational in the boundaries discourse, it is in in itself an evolving field. Yeah, let me repeat that again. Western psychology, while foundational in the boundaries discourse, is itself an evolving field which does not get talked about enough. Many of its core principles were developed in the context of hyper-individualistic cultures, and it's only recently that efforts have even been made to integrate non-Western perspectives into mainstream psychological practice. And this integration is still an ongoing process and Western psychology has yet to fully account for the complexities of how boundaries, for example, function in collectivist societies. While the concept is an immensely helpful tool, it is certainly not the one-size-fits-all solution it is often sold as. Understanding the societal dynamics at play here is crucial 
Since we are talking about this, I want to give you a South Asian lens and uh, the impact of what is often referred to as family worship. I'd like to take a minute here to address some personal experiences and observations as an um, Indian German third culture kid of South Asian ancestry who grew up on four countries and um, has had to learn the intricacies of boundaries the hard way. Relationships in South Asian families, for example, are often defined by obligations to the community and extended family even, with a strong emphasis on shared responsibilities. There's a dreaded saying called Lok Kya Kahenge, that's a Hindi saying, which means what will people say? It's an apt representation of the emphasis placed on social judgment and family reputation, which will often take precedence over individual needs or privacy. Another particularly relevant aspect of Indian culture is family worship, where uh, strong familial bonds and interdependence are central to social structures. This is a dynamic where family loyalty often will take precedence over individual desires, leading to a culture where personal boundaries can be very difficult to establish in the first place. The family unit is considered paramount, sometimes to the point of sacred and this dynamic while offering a sense of belonging to some can also truncate personal growth severely when abused so it might be very empowering for one artistic archetype while completely inappropriate for another especially for independent artists who don't belong to gharanas or traditional Indian musical families or clans and rely on unique personal experiences and emotional vulnerability for their creative process, the pressures from family to conform can adversely affect artistic freedom and expression drastically. And this brings me to my next point, uh, which has been a question I've always been asking myself. It's also a work in progress. And that question is, is there a global standard for boundaries. As younger generations from non-Western cultures engage online with a more globalized conversation around mental health, which is still mostly influenced by Western models, actually, we find ourselves in an increasing struggle to balance certain traditional values with modern notions of self-care. The risk here is ending up applying Western-centric ideas of boundaries in rigid ways, potentially damaging relationships that operate under a different set of expectations. Um, Personally, just to clarify, I would contend that the need for healthy boundaries is a human one, regardless of cultural idiosyncrasies. I've also had to work very hard to put this philosophy into practice, by the way, and it didn't come without collateral damage. But I also think that how the concept of boundaries is interpreted and practiced will benefit immensely with a sense of awareness and sensitivity to the cultural context in which it's being applied. That way, we are aware of exactly what it is that we're signing up for. Let me repeat that once more. I think I would contend, and I think this is imperative, no matter which part of the world you're in, we are living in a very globalized society. The manner in which the concept of boundaries is interpreted and practiced will benefit immensely with a sense of awareness and sensitivity to the cultural context in which it's being applied. I have clients who are in the Midwest of America. I have clients who are in the deep in the south of India. I have clients in uh, students, clients. When I say clients, I also refer to students or collaborators um, in Southern Europe and uh, some in Latin America. Uh, I, I can't think off the top of my head if I have any uh, clients in Africa per se, but I will tell you this contexts and the way they vary amidst the situations which artists are constantly faced with, they can be so drastically different, even though the primary pain points are universal. That's equally um, important, by the way. The primary pain points all of us deal with, the primary struggles we deal with as artists, you'd be shocked at how similar, not just similar, near identical they are, no matter which part of the world we come from. But the nuances, the idiosyncrasies, and the context and the role that plays makes it feel so, so different. And it's imperative that we don't 
try to bypass that and always take that into consideration. My little two pence as a third culture kid who grew up on four countries, three continents and literally works five time zones at the moment is, uh, is, is you know, is privileged enough to work with an extraordinarily diverse group of uh, artists. Okay, so big question now, in my humble opinion, is how do poor boundaries affect independent artists anyway? You know, regardless of culture, like generally speaking, what are the universal ways in which independent artists get affected if their boundaries are not in place? Well, to start off with, for us, for independent artists, poor boundaries in professional settings often go unnoticed until we've already faced the worst case scenarios. Something like burnout, tension or exploitation. Artists tend to be sensitive and often easily overwhelmed by external pressures. And this sensitivity is often the same force that fuels our creativity, allowing us to tap into deep emotional reservoirs. It's also what makes us more susceptible to emotional exhaustion, overstimulation, and we work in very um, collaborative environments a lot of times as well with very diverse groups of people where personal and professional lives intertwine in a very non-linear and complex fashion. The pressure to be constantly available or take on underpaid or worse, unpaid gigs for exposure or allow creative input to be taken for granted are common issues that arise when boundaries are not clearly set. Additionally, the more informal nature of the music industry in the first place often means that musicians tend to be reluctant to establish formal boundaries. Formal boundaries, not just boundaries which are meant to be implied, but formal ones like contracts or conversations. And a lot of the times we don't do that because... Uh, we're, we're worried or we're scared that it might close off opportunities or make us feel um, or make us seem difficult to work with. And unfortunately, more often than not, this leads to us being stretched too thin, emotionally drained, financially strained and creatively compromised. I'm going to talk about the role of trauma now. For a lot of artists, early childhood trauma, including family trauma, and the toll it takes um, on self-esteem in their formative years play a very, very significant role. Stress on formative years, because um, there is a very small window during our lifespan where we are formative in a way that just is not reversible. You know, that is not to say that we lose our ability to keep learning. I'm not going to be an advocate for that. I don't believe that. But there is a specific brand of formation that takes place only in a very specific period of our lives as well, which is the first to nine years. And this has been a hot topic, but probably a topic for a very, very different, like a whole different podcast episode as well. But this is... Um, another thing that really does need it to be taken into the whole equation. The studies show that early experiences of um, invalidation, enmeshment or neglect can lead to difficulties in establishing and maintaining healthy boundaries later in life. And I can confirm this, by the way, because uh, often the very wounds that make us vulnerable also shape our artistic expression, turning our creative practice into both a sanctuary and a coping mechanism. And that is such a risky mix. So without strong boundaries, we're really risking jeopardizing that sacred internal space where we create art, which can lead to some pretty severe consequences like anxiety, burnout, and uh, generally diminished creative output or like fear-based creative output. The big question at this point, believe it or not, for a lot of people, especially artists, is to boundary or not boundary? In other words, what's the solution here? 
do we you know do we use boundaries as a, as a default tool in our professional and personal lives if so how or do we use it at all because apparently it's not as very far and as safe a tool as a lot of people make it out to be so what do we do here do we boundary or don't we boundary is it a yes or a no and the answer to that in my humble opinion is that a cookie cutter reply to that is not just potentially counterproductive or even the question of what the f is a boundary in the first place because generally speaking the key is finding a balance that protects your personal well-being without bulldozing the humanity on which collaboration and spontaneity and vulnerability in the arts inherently thrive on now that probably sounds a little generic redundant even but it's exactly the kind of tenet it's exactly the kind of fundamental rule that is surprisingly easy to forget amidst all the noise out there and even trickier to actually implement so here are a few actionable steps or a few suggestions for a, a few actionable steps for um, which you can consider because i do want to leave you with something constructive that you can actually uh, work with you ready for this number 1 practice self reflection artists should regularly check in with themselves to understand and gauge the emotional mental and creative limits tools like journaling or meditating can help identify situations where boundaries may need strengthening or have been overstepped on violated mindful awareness of triggers energy levels and emotional responses are um, very valuable insights into when and where to set boundaries and also to generally have a compass on how to design our personalized customized system number 2 develop emotional intelligence easier said than done but boundaries are about self protection um but it's also about understanding the needs and perspective of others at least to a certain degree anyway so building emotional intelligence will help you recognize your boundaries being compromised and um it'll help you do this without becoming overtly defensive or shut down or just shut off to feedback you know and my uh, guess is it will go a long way in helping you create a more balanced dynamic between protecting your space and respecting the space of others in collaborative environments number 3 shift the mindset to growth now growth mindset is another buzzword i'm you know i have a blog post out on this as well shift the mindset to growth cultivate your growth mindset it's important to frame boundary settings as an act of personal growth rather than defensiveness and this you know this is a big 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 shift you want to grow you want to use set boundaries because you want to help focus and not because you just want to shut yourself in you know you don't want it to backfire in a way you just built walls all around you and find yourself com- completely isolated that's not the idea and it's one of the easiest traps to fall into generally artists like us we often feel that setting boundaries might um, make us seem invincible but that's a bit of a fallacy because we often end up just making ourselves unapproachable but if you keep this growth mindset perspective in mind you know and approach the whole thing with a little more self compassion it's going to help you encourage collaboration uh, based on mutual respect rather than any kind of emotional exploitation or depletion so that was number 3 shift the mindset to growth uh, it's a big one it's it's been a big big help in my personal case by the way and it gave me a very good compass to really identify the real role of boundaries personally i always tended to err on the side of isolation i would just keep isolating myself without realizing it in my uh, attempt to protect myself because my boundaries have been violated pretty severely in certain phases of my life uh, i learned the hard way i was horrible at identifying when my boundaries were being overstepped on so i had a very intense phase where i just put walls up and needless to say that backfire too so finding that balance you know if i had had a better understanding of what the growth mindset even was at the time i'm pretty sure i'd have done a much better job 
Growth mindset, big one, folks, despite it being a somewhat cheesy self-help term at the moment. Okay, number four, communicate mindfully. Sounds obvious, but um, awareness is key in communication. Instead of using boundaries as a barrier to collaboration, again, we should focus on openly communicating our needs while remaining receptive to others. Practicing non-violent communication or mindful speech ensures that boundaries are shared without shutting down collaboration. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the idea of what non-violent communication is, go with mindful speech instead. Personally, non-violent communication is is actually a little complex to understand, uh, especially for those of us new to it. it. A lot of literature out there just kind of, you know, tends to be slightly... Uh, in my opinion, slightly, what's the word I'm looking for, I'm biased in the way it um, addresses it. It also bypasses a lot of cultural contexts. You know, um, a lot of nonviolent communication gurus would just imply that anything remotely uh, resemblant of, is that a word, resemblant? resembling anger in any way is violent, which I personally don't necessarily agree with. I don't think authentic anger is a negative um, emotion per se. I think anger is a very useful emotion and has its place as long as it, it comes from an authentic space. Imagine seeing something super in, unjust happening in front of you, which by the way is a very easy thing to do uh, in our lives and not feeling angry about it. That is not a healthy um, perspective to take. But needless to say, this is a very complicated, uh, long story short, don't get any form of fight or flight emotions or excess anger or just, you know, don't let emotions you're not sure you necessarily believe in uh, and are the result of extreme conditions make the decision on the way you communicate you know have, have be mindful when you communicate so we're on to number five prioritize self-care and recharge i keep going on about the self-care and the role it plays uh, but what doesn't get talked about enough is the fact um, is that the manner in which lack of the same affect artists, especially because it's incredibly important that we're a little more vigilant in maintaining somewhat regular self-care routines. I know regularity is not as black and white for yeah, musicians and artists because, you know, if you're on the road or if you're touring or if you have family to take care of, if you work multiple time zones, all of these are realities of being an artist in this day and age. So uh, the whole idea of regularity is a lot more easier said than done. But if you aim for regularity to be a priority in your life, you will fare better in actually attaining it. Yeah. So set that goal, just set that goal of including regularity as something you want to take seriously in your life. Also, self-care routines which go beyond just physical well-being you know, include mental and emotional health into the entire equation. Take charge, um, excuse me, take time to recharge. It's so important for uh, maintaining healthy boundaries, actually. Yeah. Most of the time, um, here's a, another thing about boundaries, boundaries, you know, and implementing them, it takes a certain kind of energy. So usually you'll find yourself having your boundaries overstepped in situations where you're aware you're slightly exhausted or tired, too tired to actually, you know, maintain boundaries. Maybe I'm generalizing here, but um, there is a correlation there between your energy levels and skills to maintain boundaries. So preserve that energy to one, set those boundaries and also to make sure you're channeling it into your art the right way. That's the whole idea. Just to clarify, you need energy to maintain those healthy boundaries and you also need the energy to actually create art, which is why you're setting those boundaries in the first place. And needless to say, all of this means that there is a lot of energy in general that you need. And in order to have that necessary energy, you want to be putting in enough time for your self-care and your recharging time, your me time. Get it? Number six, seek mentorship. I mean, needless to say, I would qualify as someone who has vested interests here by saying something like this because I run a coaching business. But seriously, I, I, I'm also get I get mentored myself, and I can only confirm mentorship from experienced professionals provides invaluable guidance in navigating these complexities. 
um, especially in setting boundaries and maintaining boundaries in the music industry and the arts ecosystem, learning from someone who successfully managed their personal and professional relationships or actually are in the thick of it and whatever successful means, you know, heads up, there is no perfect system anyways in the first place. That's just the best we can do and the best awareness we can exercise. And having someone who's got more experience than you and has a few, a little more awareness and knowledge and tools to offer to uh, navigate these conundrums is um, invaluable. My mentors have done me such a huge solid, mostly by offering the kind of insight into how I can assert my needs while remaining to collaboration. It was the kind of thing, or still is sometimes the kind of thing, which is so difficult or complex to evaluate sometimes, especially when I'm in the thick of it, you know. A lot of times I'll take distance and then, you know, look back on hindsight and come up with an aha moment where I think, oh, shucks, I should just have done that, you know. I mean, it's the kind of thing I, I've been uh, advising my clients and, and students for years now. But when I'm in the thick of it myself, I can't confirm. It's a very different experience. You cannot be your own mentor. You cannot be your own coach. You cannot be your own therapist. Your therapist, coach or mentor can't do the work for you either, by the way. That's the other side of the coin. But there is no substitute for uh, your team, be that your therapist, your coach or mentor, which all three of which have something uh, in common, by the way, quite a lot in common, uh, despite the difference. But generally speaking, seek mentorship. Uh, also, that brings me to my next point. Consider therapy. Therapy provides a safe space for uh, folks to explore how our personal experiences, traumas and relational patterns influence a professionalizer. Th therapists can really help identify areas where boundaries need to be set more firmly and offer strategies for maintaining them without alienating. In a lot of cases, some coaches will um, use and therapeutical tools. I happen to be one of them. I have a background in psychotherapy, which I uh, use in my coaching sessions. That's another option to look at, um, working with coaches and mentors who have a background in a particular modality that you uh, resonate with. Now also consider investing in career coaching, by the way, a career coach, like particularly one with experience in the creative industries with industry specific tools they can offer you for setting your professional boundaries. Very, very helpful, depending on context. They can help you with stuff like negotiating contracts, managing uh, collaborations, uh, but also like generally creating sustainable work habits that respect both your time and your collaborators. Establish personal work hours. Yeah, define your availability. Musicians don't do this enough. There is another tool. Uh, learn to say no. Foster open communication anyways. And last but not the least, at the risk of sounding somewhat repetitive, prioritize self-care. So those are my list of tools which I personally would uh, highly encourage you to consider. If you've been taking notes, brilliant. If not, feel free to come around to the blog post. It's all there for you to save and read through if you're uh, the kind of person who likes reading through all of this, kind of internalize it more. It's all there. Um, generally speaking, to summarize what we talked about today, and this was an intense episode. I know I told you this, you know, boundaries are such such a such a such a sensitive topic, such an intense topic, almost inflammatory topic in some parts of the world. I really want to, you know, dedicate a little more time than I usually do, do my best to kind of just go the extra mile and share stuff which I think might be helpful for you folks. Embracing the complexity of boundaries. Yeah, that's that's my summary of this because it is a complex concept. And we do want to embrace it. And the best way to go about that is just reminding ourselves that ultimately, ultimately, boundaries are about creating a healthy balance between protecting yourself and engaging meaningfully with others. While the oversimplification of boundaries on social media may make uh, them seem like a tool for avoidance, counterintuitively enough, the real power of boundaries lies actually in fostering open, respectful relationships that allow for both personal growth and collective success. And that's a bit of a mindfuck. There, I said it. I almost made it through an entire episode without swearing, but 
That's the thing. That's where the mind fuck factor comes in. And that's why so many of us are messing up this whole idea of boundaries because we actually want to use a tool which draws a line to achieve a goal which actually is collaborative. Get it? So I'm going to repeat this again. The real power of boundaries actually lies in succeeding in fostering those open, respectful relationships that allow space for both our personal growth and collective success. And for independent musicians, the challenge is not only setting boundaries, but maintaining them in a way that allows creativity to thrive. And that's a lot more complex than people realize. But by understanding the nuances of boundaries informed both by personal, cultural and professional context, we can move beyond the buzzword and use this concept to build healthier, more sustainable relationships. Hope that helps. Hey folks, I hope you found that episode helpful. Um, Here's a little request. If you did, consider sharing this episode with your folks. Think about the ways in which they might benefit the way you did. And please don't ever hesitate to reach out if you have queries. My name's TL. I'm an independent musician and educator and the founder of the Holistic Musician Academy. 